Welcome to Youth Residential Facilities, Leveraging Federal Policy to Increase Community-Based Services and Reduce Dependency on Institutions. This uh, presentation will be given this afternoon by myself and Eric Buhlman from NDRN and Andrea Mixon from the Alabama Disabilities Advocacy Project. My name is Diane Smith-Howard. I'm a Managing Attorney for Institutions and Community Integration at NDRN. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a middle-aged woman with glasses and long hair. Next slide. Next slide, okay. okay. This webinar was developed in part under contract um, with a long number from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the US Department of Health and Human Services, and the views, policies, and opinions expressed are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of SAMHSA or HHS. Next slide. So this is a uh, part of the NDRN Bazelon webinar series. This webinar is part one of a two-part webinar, webinar learning community hosted by NDRN and the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law that addresses SAMHSA's priorities for crisis stabilization, mobile crisis, and children. The learning community will focus on leveraging federal funding and policy to increase best practice community-based services that are voluntary, evidence-based, and trauma-informed. Next slide. Today's webinar, which would be leveraging federal funding and policy to increase community-based services and reduce dependency on institutions, will be presented by NDRN and um, ADAP, will focus more specifically on youth residential and crisis services. So we'll be talking about the problems caused by overuse of institutionalization and how to, um, how to make changes to those policies, the policies that place children unnecessarily in institutions. Bazelon's webinar, Advancing an Alternative, Peer-Led Community-Based Services that Promote Equity and Safety for All, zooms out to the full framework and menu of community-based services. So as we're talking today, if you're thinking to yourself, well, what would work better? And what are some things that we could be doing in the community as an alternative to these placements? Know that the Bazelon uh, webinar will talk about those in greater specifics. And my understanding is that that webinar falls next Friday. Next slide. So the learning objectives to, for today, participants will understand the concerns posed by unnecessary institutionalization of children and youth with disabilities, especially those with SED. We'll know the various methods by which advocates have challenged institutionalization of children or youth with SED and be prepared to work a second, sorry. Um, at the state level, utilizing federal and or state policies for systemic improvements to community-based mental health services systems for children and youth with SED. Next slide. Next slide. All right, I'm going to start by talking about institutional placement. Children and youth, including those with SED, housed in residential treatment facilities, can be abused, neglected, and unnecessarily institutionalized in violation of state and federal law. That's quite a statement, so I will be uh, backing that up and providing some specifics as we go forward. Institutionalization could be reduced if not avoided with the provision of appropriate community-based supports. Next slide. What are the outcomes for youth placed in congregate settings? And I think the institutional knowledge over um, the course of history, everybody knows that congregate care or use of institutionalizations is uh, institutionalization is detrimental to children, but it's helpful to know precisely how that is. Children need consistent nurturing adults in their lives in order to form healthy attachments and to develop positive socio-emotional skills. Congregate care settings for children have been found to increase exposure to trauma and to negatively impact educational progress. And these are outcomes from a Casey family study, February 2nd of 2018. Next slide. While modest short-term benefits have been identified in a few instances, effects do not appear to be sustained. What that refers to is that when children are placed in specific programs that are intended to address particular unique needs that are difficult to address in the community, that on occasion it is appropriate to place children in these settings to get that treatment for as short a period of time as possible. But overall, research indicates that youth who experience group placements have higher re-entry rates after exiting 
in other words, recidivism, right? If you were in the juvenile justice system, it would be called recidivism. So kids who leave a facility are more likely to return. They are almost two and a half times more likely than their peers in foster care to become delinquent. They have lower test scores in English and math, in part that has to do with the quality of the schools in these placements. Next slide. And are less likely to graduate high school when compared to youth in family-based foster care. They are at risk of physical abuse when placed in group settings, are less likely to achieve permanency, meaning a permanent adult placement with adult home in a home, than those raised in non-relative foster families, lack opportunities to develop crit critical life skills and positive relationships, and experience group or institutional placements as prison-like, punitive, and traumatic. Next slide. So NDRN did a report um, back in October of 21 that reported on the work of the PNA network in their monitoring of privately operated youth residential facilities. And these are facilities that children are placed in by juvenile justice entities, school districts, by parental placement, um, usually using private insurance. But most often these are kids who are in the foster care system or the child welfare system, so wards of the state, and the state did not feel that they could provide an appropriate community-based service um, placement for them. And so they placed them in a residential facility, most often out of state in another state. So this profiles the reality of residential treatment for youth through PNA casework examples and monitoring reports. And Andrea Mixon, who will follow me as the next speaker, will talk more specifically about that. But this, these, um, these reports are based primarily on the experiences and knowledge gained by PNAs as they go into facilities to do monitoring. Next slide. So PNA monitoring and investigation of youth residentials staff found that youth are not are prevented from contact with their families sometimes entirely oftentimes just 10 minutes per week and that those calls are often monitored so that children do not feel like they can connect with their families and it's harder for their families to know how to meet their needs when they return home they do not receive critical medical care and time to prevent serious injury medication is administered as chemical restraint to control behavior um, there's obviously nothing wrong with medication that is prescribed by a psychiatrist or a medical doctor that the child needs and is followed up on. But what we saw frequently is the use of PRN shots, kids who are given psychotropic or other serious medications as a, in a shot form to address a specific behavioral intervention that would calm them down. Um, so use as a chemical restraint. And sometimes those um, the youth were not even prescribed that medication, so you didn't even know if it was safe for them. Next slide. During PNA monitoring investigation, we found that restraint and seclusion is systematically imposed on youth instead of used only in the most severe circumstances. Physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, both staff on youth and peer on peer. And in some cases, staff would be egging youth on to assault each other. Police calls and elopement due to lack of supervision. We saw a lot of staffing issues that resulted in very serious lack of supervision. So children were not um, protected from one another or prevented from leaving the building. Um, and then obviously minors in state care would be out on their own. Filth, vermin, poor nutrition, and very derelict structures, including leaky ceilings and children sleeping on concrete pads with very thin mattresses and all the other horribles that I'm sure you can imagine. Next slide. Some facilities did not provide any psychiatric treatment or psychological treatment other than medication, or in some cases, none at all. And these are facilities that are receiving Medicaid funds or other public money to provide treatment. That is their specific purpose. Others fail to provide evidence-based treatment, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and trauma-informed care. Medication oversight and regular follow-up visits often did not occur, and these are very serious medications being administered to developing children. So youth reported serious side effects, including organ damage and weight gain, sometimes resulting in uh, lifelong diabetes. Next slide. 
But fortunately, there are viable alternatives to residential treatment that eliminate the need or shorten stays. And the law requires and research supports the use of these alternatives. Next slide. And Andrea is going to tell you what that looks like in a case example from the state of Alabama. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for an opportunity to speak with you today about um, the kind of work we're doing at ADAP for children who have serious emotional disturbance. Next slide. Okay, I wanted to give you guys just a couple of examples that are pro will probably ring true for um, the kids you were working with. But if you'll just kind of look over the fact scenario for this slide and, and a couple of the other ones, you will see um, a child maybe in elementary school that has significant um, diagnoses, including impulse control disorder and reactive attachment. You'll notice the number of residential placements this child has had since being four years old, four, six different therapists, two different psychiatrists, and grandparents who are, are taking care of the child. Next slide. And here we have Brent, who is 16, has autism, and is engaged in self-injurious behavior, rages, and running away. And unfortunately, the police on the, are on the grandmother's speed dial. Next slide. And then Sylvia, uh, 16 years old, um, anxiety disorder, uh, a number of diagnoses there, uh, has been in foster care, so has been most likely in some of the residential placements that Diane described, and again, discharged to a grandparent. All of these uh, three all of these children we've described uh, represent hundreds of kids in um, Alabama who may be in foster care, but they may also be receiving special education services. And one of the ways in which we learned of these children is through ADAP's um, special education advocacy. In doing and in advocating in IEP meetings, individual education plan meetings, we often ask parents Tell us about the services that you get outside of the school to support your child and to support your family. What are the um, outpatient, in-home behavior supports that a Sylvia or a, or a Brent might need? And oftentimes we would hear a parent say, well, we have an in-home in behavior intervention team that's uh, provided by the community mental health center but right now we are told that we can only receive that in-home intervention for 12 weeks and that's it. There's really not maybe a few weeks more of services, but we were told by the Community Mental Health Center counselor that 12 weeks of in-home is it. So as you can imagine, um, when that is in play, and particularly if you have a young child, you're going to encounter, families are going to encounter um, a lot of things down the road into adolescence, and their options are going to be very limited uh, for mental health treatment. And so, as you can see from these slides, you could have the police called, you can have family members who are just having to take their child to the emergency room. And when children get into the emergency room, as, as you're probably aware, the um, potential for them for a psychiatrist or psychologist to request an intensive residential placement only increases. And then if you multiply that by the number of res, uh, acute placements over the course of months, then you may very likely find a situation where the child is either entering um, foster care or uh, hopefully not a commitment, but Regardless, you're going to have a very unhealthy, disruptive childhood. Next slide. And when you think about these children and uh, a lot of whom are receiving um, Medicaid services, um, those children are entitled as children under 21 to get a robust Medicaid benefit under EPSDT. And it, this whole EPSD program is designed to ensure that children receive early detection and care so that health problems are averted or diagnosed and treated as early as possible. 
Uh, the goal of EPSDT is to ensure that the individual child get the health care they need when they need it and the right care to the right child at the right time in the right setting. So if you go back to that young man who, who started a lot of his placements when after his um, fourth birthday, you can see how important um, early is. Next slide. Uh, and so EPSDT, a lot of times, at least in our state, I think is looked upon as, you know, you go to your pediatrician every year, you get a, a well child checkup, they're looking at physical issues, um, they're looking at, okay, what can we provide for the, the physical health of a child, but in our state, I think there was a huge disconnect between the funding of mental health services through EPSDT and the fact that the services a child is entitled to under EPSDT are very broad. Next slide. And so when you think of being very broad, you think a couple of different ways. Number one, the diagnosis of a particular disability may come very early on. Um, in a child's life. You can think of um, autism as one example of how um, early diagnoses occur. Um, you also think of broadness, though. Um, you think of anything that's medically necessary to ameliorate a condition. And that goes back to looking at um, not only the type of service, which could be mental health as well as physical health, but you look at the fact that there should not be arbitrary caps or limitations on the length of treatment for a child. So tying all that back into what we're talking about today, what we want to do and what the system should be doing under the law is lifting any caps for mental health care for kids. Next slide. Um, and there again, to reemphasize um, any condition, next slide, all that are necessary. And that we'll talk about in addition to all that's necessary, we're going to talk a little bit about capacity. Um, some people, some kids in the state are able to get, we're able to get a greater amount of mental health services than other poor rural parts of the state perhaps didn't have an opportunity not only to get in-home service, but perhaps not even to get it for 12 weeks. Next slide. Okay, so when ADAP started learning more and more about the population of kids, who needed in-home services. And when I say in-home, I mean crisis stabilization. I mean um, a treatment plan for youth and parents in their home that is gonna be able to address you know, specific behaviors that are causing maybe placements in um, acute settings or resulting in the police being called, those types of things. Those are the types of, of children that we went to the state to, and I would say, I think beginning in 2016. And what we said to them basically, in essence, are here are some examples of a problem that is statewide, and here is the federal law, EPSDT. And going back to all medically necessary and no caps, we're seeing the disconnect between what kids should be getting under the law and what they're actually getting in essence. So what we wanted to tell them is look through your code, look through your regulation, and you will see there that there are some utilization controls that are in place. And if they're not intended to be, they're in effect are operating as utilization controls. And we want to engage with you in a series of negotiations, hopefully, that are going to make the system better. Um, we had anticipated that if it came to it, we may need to file litigation. 
Uh, fortunately, we didn't, and the state of Alabama and ADAP, along with our partners at the Center for Public Representation, did enter into a settlement agreement regarding in-home-based health services. And if you are if you are familiar, you will know that uh, CPR, Center for Public Representation, did a very similar case that had national import, the Rosie D case. So a lot of the work we did in Alabama was based on that litigation. Next slide. So the uh, just basic definition of serious emotional disturbance, I don't think differs too much from um, what you see nationally. Um, and this is this particular description is what we worked off with for our settlement. So a child, adolescent, 19 years or less, a legal resident of Alabama, 19 is the age of majority in Alabama. Um, the child must either have a diagnosis and separated from the family and out of home placement or be at risk thereof. Next slide. And here's a list of functional impairments that, of course, um, we were seen in lots of different places across the state. And again, having the opportunity as a PNA to represent kids in facilities and then represent kids in special education matters and juvenile justice allowed us to identify some of these gaps here. Next slide. And symptoms. Now, when you first see this and you take this slide alone, you may think, oh, well, the only way I'm going to be a, a child would be diagnosed with SED is that they have psychotic disorders or suicidal or homicidal gesture ideation. That is one of the three um, areas. It is not the, it is not the necessary um, component to SED. But if you look at the functional limitations you, or the risk of out-of-home placement or the symptoms, one of those will um, qualify a, a child to be described as having a serious emotional disturbance. Next slide. Um, risk of separation. So um, I'll emphasize as we transition into our, my next work, um, you as a PNA, you may go in and monitor a facility and you start talking to a kid in their history. And sooner or later, you may come back to a description of a child who's who's been with their grandparents, like I've just described. And you can it's almost like a, a very bad movie. You can go back and see where in the whole scheme of things was this child provided, say, in-home intervention services. And that's when bells go off, when you hear a child say, I didn't have anyone come into my home or they came in for about three weeks and then they closed their case. Next slide. Um, so again, our settlement was emphasizing that we must have an expansion of services and they must be statewide. So we have community mental health centers in regions in the state. There's probably about 10 and they cover in each each um, community mental health center, I think, covers about three different counties, depending on the population of each county. Um, and the the hardest hit, of course, are going to be in your rural areas. So we have what's called the Black Belt in South Alabama and it's composed of, of, of a lot of individuals who are African-American, who are very, the socioeconomic status is very low. There's not much industry in that area. And when we went in to talk about services, that was very, very hard to take because there's very few of any kind of outpatient services for children, much less in-home. Next slide. Um, in addition, I'll just highlight that in addition to the SED diagnosis that we wanted to make sure kids, um, those kids had services, children who were duly diagnosed with SED and autism spectrum disorder were also 
on our radar. Um, when a child would go to a, a community mental health center and they would ask for services, and if they had a primary diagnosis of ASD, um, a lot of times they'd be turned away because the definition for providing in-home services was limited to children um, with a with an uh, SED categorization. So there was a lot of going back and forth with the state and with about categorization and about services and under Medicaid, you know, every condition should be treatable. We shouldn't be um, limiting ourselves to an only one type of diagnosis. So you will see that there was, before this settlement, there was a huge gap um, in regards to children who have behavior issues in the home and who also have ASD. Next slide. So this intensive home-based services are, I think, going to be discussed more fully uh, when Baslon is up next to talk about the variety and types of services. But our emphasis is that they are less costly and of course, more helpful for children to be in a home-like setting. Next slide. And so here are the parties at the table during our settlement. Next slide. And this was the timeline. So you can see it, it took a minute to get there. Um, we had productive meetings. I think a lot of things were straightforward in terms of EPSDT regulations. And so um, we were able to, to make a lot of progress. It's just a lot of that was just educating um, providers and the state on the necessity to build out their in-home service program. Next slide. Um, you know, these are just some of the things, not attitudinally, that we wanted to address, and we still are um, in Alabama, and I think every every state does, is just saying, you know, we're, we're not just looking at, at our system change as a matter of dollars and cents, we're looking at it as to how this improves the, our state, improves the families, how it, how it increases um, you know, a lot of different things that in terms of um, economy and productivity that people in the state government like to talk about. Next slide. So here is the kind of the, the list of services um, that are were covered under our community mental health centers. Peer supports and therapeutic, I think that should be therapeutic mentoring, not monitoring. Um, they are still, we still struggle with that. I think, um, you know, when you talk about attitude change, I think sometimes there's still a, a little bit of education or appreciation of how, how well researched and how successful therapeutic and peer mentoring can be. So we're working on that. Um, we are also still working on gaps. Uh, next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, now, yeah. um, we have multiple agencies who could at any time contact the parent or tell the parent or themselves go and contact the community mental health center and refer a child for in-home services. So it's equally important not just to change the system, but to inform the various child serving agencies of how kids can access in-home services. Next. Okay, um, intensive care coordination. Um, as a PNA, you, you guys may be familiar with how sometimes protection and advocacy agencies and others, other, other serving agencies become in essence care coordinators. But having that Medicaid funding means a huge diff means um, is very important, I should say, because there's so many different um, serving agencies from special education to voc rehab to DHR, Department of Mental Health, community mental health centers, all of those various agencies 
in a child's life are um, important, but they need to be talking to each other. And so this is what this intensive care coordination is supposed to be doing. And it's using the basis for um, eligibility is going to be some objective measurements, such as the strength and needs assessment under the CANS, a medical necessity determination um, for the necessity of in-home services, and then have developing a treatment plan that's individualized through a child and family team. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, and this one is basically um, informing us about how the various entry points to intake. And I'll say that when we reach this settlement, and we're looking at from the very beginning to the end of how does a child get referred for in home, how does care coordination take place, ADAP um, was part of a monitoring process and still is um, to some degree about how well all of these changes are working. So um, part of our monitoring is to, to go back and look at our kids utilizing this in-home service that we had the caps lifted for. Um, do, do parents and families um, get referred and where do they get the referrals from? Um, are they getting intakes that are assigned to an outpatient therapist when they could also benefit from an in-home in service? And if they're very high intensity cases, like maybe there's a child that's been to an acute setting many, many times or has been in a residential treatment, how are those being managed? Um, those, um, these type services are all the ones that ADAP is monitored under the settlement. Next slide. Okay, those are, and again, these are some of the um, services that are available, not always, I say available, should be available. Um, we've had some gaps, so I'll go ahead and say, uh, since this agreement was reached, there are still staffing gaps, as probably there are across the country, with in-home intervention, with care coordination. Um, it's, it's not all there, but the foundation is there. The state understands its responsibility to have these um, uh, services fully staffed. And so thinking through what's next is always like the advocate's dilemma. But um, we have made progress. We're still working, work in progress. Next slide. And you can look here about if you're wanting to know a little bit about what our autism services look like. We've got a link for that. Next slide. Okay, I want to pivot real quick to the work we're doing in the foster care system. So Diane mentioned to you all of the things that are going on and have gone on in intensive residential facilities, the abuse, the neglect, um, I would almost say abandonment in terms of children staying long periods of time when they don't need to stay in a facility, when they're ready to be discharged. All of those sorts of things were of huge importance to us over the years because we monitor and investigate. ADAP um, issued a report of our monitoring um, in July of 2020. It was a public report. I believe it's on the NDRN website that discusses some of the things we uncovered in the sequel operated facilities. And in talking to um, kids in sequel and then all other PRTFs in the state, we'd start to again unravel their, their life history. And it emerged from that work, a class of kids um, who were not getting um, discharged in an appropriate time or manner from a facility or were placed in a facility when they could have received these in-home services I just discussed. So we brought litigation in May of 2021, and I say we, ADAP, um, Children's Rights and the Southern Poverty Law Center, brought a class action lawsuit 
And we allege that DHR discriminated against foster children by unnecessarily segregating them in restrictive psychiatric residential treatment facilities and denying them an opportunity to grow up in loving homes. Next slide. And these children were segregated in these facilities. They're less likely to achieve permanency. They're more likely to age out of foster care. Um, we've, we've seen some children who graduated when they were 18 and they're still in a facility a year later. And we ask them, what are you doing here? And they say, well, I, I don't really know what I said. Are you, you going to college? Are you getting college credit? No, I just sit in class all day with the kids who are in ninth and 10th grade. Next slide. And so not only do children stay long lengths of time when they should be discharged, they also, we found shuffle from one facility to the next. So you may see a child that entered um, care and maybe they were six years old when they entered care. They never found a foster home or foster home disrupted and then they're 13, 14 and they go from one facility to the next. Um, and it's amazing to see records where you see children going into seven different facilities, some twice in one facility over the course of three or four years. All of this falls back to the fact that DHR, we allege our, our child welfare agency is not administering its programs in a way that is in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then that violation is of course what what prompted the lawsuit back in the 90s, the Olmstead litigation. Next slide. Okay, and this describes our lawsuit. Um, and we've also noticed that the population in a lot of these facilities is disproportionately Black youth. And the word that we have used, which I think adequately describes these children, is that they're languishing in these facilities. They're not getting vocational rehabilitation services. That's a huge concern to me. Special education services many times is substandard. And they really just are not living a normal teenage life. And so when they leave the custody of the state at 18, you start to see some of those outcomes that Diane explained um, can happen when a young adult is left without an appropriate normal teenage opportunities. Next slide. And again, this is this is the crux of the matter. It's the violations, the policies, the practices, the lack of we claim appropriate discharge planning from these facilities that is in essence a violation of ADA. We're currently in discovery right now um, in this lawsuit. So uh, We've got a little ways to go. Uh, next slide. But we want to do is to build out, we want DHR to build out its foster care. Um, not only the placements, foster care homes and placements, the training for foster parents that is going to hopefully prevent some of the disruptions, the opportunity to expand community services, just like we were doing and advocating for with our Department of Mental Health in the EPSDT matter I spoke a few minutes ago. All of those things um, we are emphasizing in this lawsuit and seek remedies for. And in fact, DHR has admitted in its publications through the years that it does over rely on residential treatment facilities. Next slide. And I think that's it for me. So I'm going to let this little owl um, ask you if you have any questions, and then we'll go back to Kelly. Well, I've got a Rare. question for you, Andrea, in yeah. terms of the the first the settlement that you've had. How has the implementation been going, especially with the impact of COVID? Well, I think generally speaking, the COVID has has really played into the staffing issues that we, that mental health centers are experiencing. Um, we, we set out the, the basis and the foundation upon which the state is required to provide the services. 
issues now are with the rate of pay for in-home behavioral therapists, um, finding people who or want to, to be in that particular career. I think our state is one of those states that was already pretty kind of lax when it came to COVID restrictions. So I don't think that that is necessarily um, people coming in and out of homes is not as much of the issue here. It's just um, finding people who will fill these positions and paying people a fair wage. Have you found, um, how's the transition been going for those that have been taking advantage of the settlement? How's the transition going? Yeah. Well, I think what we have, like, I think even as of last year, we still had a lot of counties without in-home intervention. Um, we have 67 and we probably had about a third who still are without adequate in-home intervention services. And then about seven, this was May of last year, about 17 without um, integrated care coordination. So it's it's been a challenge and it will be. And, um, you know, I think we, in any kind of work like this, it's, you, you know, leaving it behind is, is something you hate to do. And I don't think we intend to do that anytime soon, but um, it, it hasn't. And I think COVID did have a lot to do with that particular piece because the settlement came in 2017. And then our memorandum of agreement with the state came in 2020. And so that, that I'm sure played a significant role in, in getting, getting us where we wanted to be. What have you found to be the barriers in other than the the rate of pay that you talked about? What other barriers have cropped up to really fully implementing this settlement? Well, I think I think making uh, different agencies making the referrals, knowing to make the referrals to in home intervention is is a large part of the of the challenge we've had. Um, there's particularly in, I think, a special education setting, what you often find is still, rather than a referral being made out to a local mental health center, you may find, again, a behavior uh, disciplinary action that's really only going to keep the child out for 10 days or 15 days or sometimes 45 days. And I think that is still a huge barrier is the fact that there's not the buy-in that there should be from particularly people in the education world. There's school-based mental health counseling, but I don't think that that's been as effective in terms of ensuring that the number of kids who know and families who know about in-home are actually taking advantage of it. And then in terms of where exactly are you on the, the Olmstead uh, litigation? So on the Olmstead, we are we are right in the middle of discovery. So we um, we're in deposition time right now. Um, we would expect that a class certification would be coming in the next, you know, nine to 12 months. And these things always change, but um, trial would be probably next fall. So we're doing class search um, after some discovery here, finishing up. And then we got a question from Don O'Brien. Um, do you think diversity plays a part in the way services are offered? Well, I think that there is some inequity, clearly, when it comes to certain areas of the state that are not getting um, the level of services that one would expect maybe in a more um, economic advantageous area. Um, I think that as we kind of, as we have already kind of, you can appreciate there are a lot of um, situations where 
it's more normal, so to speak, for a disadvantaged disadvantaged child to have um, the police called on them rather than having a placement or a referral, say referral to a community mental health center. And that that's kind of one of those long term problems that we all have to address and address the system that's needing change. How has how has it been working? Because you, you settled with the executive branch. How has the legislative branch taken to fulfilling this these needs? Well, they we've we've been able to get, I think initially the understanding was when the time we settled the case that that there was going to have to be an appropriations or additional monies allocated to building out the and the lifting of the caps issue. Um, we have we always struggle at the legislature. I think we have we have certain things that come up in the legislature, say is this 9988 initiative where there's an emphasis on adults getting mobile crisis intervention. But when it comes to children's services, there always seems to be a, a battle to get appropriations that are actually going to address the level of mental health services that federal Medicaid requires. So it's, I think the state is, is confident or proud in some ways that they, they do so much in terms of uh, providing mental health services, but I think sometimes it gets to be a patchwork and children don't often get the um, benefit of appropriations. And then, you know, these facilities stay open these facilities that are hugely detrimental, um, there doesn't seem to be any push at the legislative area to close or to tighten regulations and licensing provisions for these residential facilities. Sherry, I'm not sure what an NSPL is. Um, I'm not sure what that. So the question is, how are other states navigating 988 and SPLs and that they are confidential by nature and in-person response is prioritized for kids? Are the NSPLs asking age of uh, National Suicide Prevention Lifelines? Thank you. <laughs> asking age of callers. Um, Andrea, I don't know if you know about what's going on in Alabama with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and anyone else that has an idea and an answer to <laughs> question, feel free to throw it into the chat. I don't know if the PNAs have much connection with the suicide prevention lifelines in terms of using them as a resource. Eric, I will um, jump in here a little bit, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So we have a community of practice meeting on Wednesday at one o'clock for folks in the PNA network working on crisis intervention issues. And I know um, not everyone on this call may be part of that, but um, there is um, there's work being done. There are some concerns about the way in which it's being done and uh, being implemented in certain places. And um, we would, uh, you know, we would. We'll be talking more about that as it as it goes along. I do know that some PNAs are working on that issue. Um, and Andrew, when you get a moment, if you have, if you can, I'd love to hear more about what exactly does peer mentoring consist of? Like what what you know on a day to day basis? What does the peer mentor do? How do they work with the person? How often? Do they, you know, like all of it? I think a lot of people just don't know how that model really works. Sure, I, I will be happy to um, share some of that and how it and how it's kind of been been challenging here, um, particularly with youth. You you just you just don't see um, any 
movement along that line in a meaningful way. I think we've come a little ways in terms of our state providing peer mentoring for for adults with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a little more challenging, but it's there for adults with mental health issues. But then when you get down to to peers and peers with mental health needs in adolescence, it it really needs to be built out. But I can certainly share some more information with you on what it's supposed to be composed of and how it should be operating. At least yeah. in Alabama. That would be helpful to know what what the model looks like, even if mm -hmm. that's not what the reality is. Like, right. Do they go and play basketball together? Do they talk about problems? Like, right. That even more. Right. So Elizabeth put a lot of good information in the chat. Um, and for accessibility purposes, I will read it. Um, with help from a federally funded health equity grant, the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Use Services is partnering with the Autism Foundation of Oklahoma, AFO, to make the state's 988 mobile crisis unit sensory friendly. In addition to providing each unit with a sensory kit, AFO is offering training and technical assistance to ensure the crisis responders are equipped to provide appropriate support for individuals on the spectrum. Research shows that the sensory kits can, affect, can effectively increase critical communications and comfort for individuals with autism and other special needs in new and high stress situations. Each sensory kit um, includes various objects and activities intended to reduce anxiety and frustration in high stress settings and emergency situations. Thank you for that information, Elizabeth. And actually, I was wondering, Andrea, since you sort of have this intersection at times of what's considered to be a development of disability on the autism spectrum and mental health, have you encountered any issues with potentially two different departments in implementing your, your objectives? So uh, our... Our services for youth with ASD and then youth with SED should both be under the Department of Mental Health. Um, both are, we have regional autism networks in our state that are located in major cities like Huntsville, Montgomery. Um, there's two in the University, Tuscaloosa, Auburn, Mobile. And they are supposed to be kind of clearing houses, meeting meeting needs of, of parents and families who are looking for autism resources. Um, but the, the, I think the challenge is, is to, again, it's, it's, it's a process of getting the referral to the right person, a parents and, and families knowing who to contact for say ABA services that are supposed to be funded through Medicaid and administered through the Department of Mental Health and the Community Mental Health Centers. And even, even after a campaign of getting the word out and, and, and trying even in ADAPT's efforts to do that, it, it, we still have a long way of going in terms of getting people to know what the next step is in terms of oh, well, how many, what does ASD look like in the home? What, how would, how would that impact um, services I may get somewhere else? How do I coordinate with our special education department in terms of we have an ABA BCBA person here, but then we're going to do ABA at home. There's a lot of um, issues with care coordination that are involved in that, and it's it's still a work in progress. But both of those, ASD and SED, are both under the auspices or the authority of our Department of Mental Health, whereas DHR is our Department of Human Resources, and that's a whole nother ball of wax in terms of children with mental health diagnoses being placed in say a residential treatment facility and not getting services to address their autism, even though they mm -hmm. sh should not be placed in, in those facilities, we often find that they are. So it's, it's a huge challenge on both ends and between both agencies for different reasons. Okay. So you are finding that to be a challenge at times. To... Oh, yes. Uh, I think someone mentioned 
about issues with out-of-state placements. Alabama doesn't have as much of that problem because we do over rely on our <laughs> on our residential placements. But I know from working with some of you guys in the past that other states are really concerned about that out-of-home residential placement issue. I, I can talk about that when we yeah. get a chance. Yeah, plenty to say. You're one of the rare states that decided to build up their, <laughs> their infrastructure for the, the institutions rather than ship them out. Mm -hmm. Dan, do you want to chime in? Sure. Um, so across the country, there are sort of sender states and receiver states. Um, there are states that have not built up their infrastructure um, of internal resources, either community or residential. And so they choose to send a lot of kids out of state. Um, and there are states um, that have less regulation that tend to attract facilities. Um, and so there's a lot of communication that goes on between the sender and receiver states. So the sending faci the, the facilities in the receiving states advertise, um, particularly to state departments of health and human services and other, the state child welfare agency. Um, they'll say, hey, we've got this great program over here and it provides these unique services that you cannot get in your state. So you'll be helping children by sending them to our out of state facility. And um, some states send hundreds of kids um, per, per year and some have decided they're not going to send anymore. Um, and so that's a big decision at the state policy level, um, particularly that's happened um, in situations where um, they discovered the abuses that we talked about when I was referring to the report earlier. So we definitely um, encourage PNAs to look carefully, or PNAs and other advocates, to look carefully at the facilities that kids are being sent to to make sure they are safe. Um, I mean, one of the things that's difficult is that if a, a family is in state A and the child is sent to state B a thousand miles away, um, they will not be able to visit and they will not be able to provide oversight. I mean, there's nothing like having a loving family member or other person come and visit the child and um, see what's going on there to expose some of the horrific abuses that we see. Or at the very least, to talk on the phone and have the parents say, have you, um, have you seen a therapist this week? And if the child says, therapist? Am I supposed to have a therapist? Um, that would be a, a red flag. Um, but in addition, just practically speaking, when a child doesn't see family um, and call home, there are less, the family members are less likely to have information they need to make sure that that return home is successful. Um, whether it's a fa foster family or a biological family, the kid is going to eventually hopefully go home. Um, and if that happens, they need to have school in place, they need to know what medications that child needs, they need to know what to do to de-escalate so whatever happened last time doesn't happen again, how to implement the behavior plan and get psychological services in place. Um, and you can't do that if you're not talking to the kid um, and seeing the kid on a regular basis. In addition, the better models um, have, fam have joint family therapy sessions so that the foster home or the biological family meets and does family therapy so that they're working on those things and ready for when the kid comes home and out of state placements often don't provide that I can go on for hours about the problems with out of state placements, but um, there are are many and there are a lot of states that are still overusing them. So Dawn put a comment in the chat. Um, just said it, but this is the comment. <laughs> I reside in the Virgin Islands, and my first thought when I read that part was, yay, lucky you. Um, <laughs> and many children had been sent off island to facilities for several years for intellectual disabilities such as autism. However, we still don't have accommodations for young adults nor adults with mental health issues. <laughs> my first thought and question that came that I was, I'd was i be interested in Dawn answering is, is, does this mean once they're sort of sent away, they don't ever come back and sort of live off I, I mean are in in institutions the rest of their life off island um and then lena says great point and 
Okay, Don answered. Uh, in many cases, when the children return, there's very little services available upon their return. So does that mean once they reach adulthood, they're sent back to the Virgin Islands automatically? Um, would be my next question. Um, but I'm also interested in other barriers beyond just sort of finding the the services, find, finding the people for provide the services um, that other states have seen pop up to sort of really creating a robust community mental health system within their state. So if you've got some other barriers that you've encountered, we appreciate it if you could put them in the chat to create a little bit of a discussion. Um, but so Andrea, since your kids tend to remain in state, do they start off in one facility? Um, oh, Don answered, sometimes they come back for various reasons, cost and age. Yeah. Um, but Andrea, do they transition from one set of facilities, which are from youth, to then go once they reach adulthood to an adult facility, or how does that work? Well, if if they're in D, which so I'll say this: most of the children in the in the residential facilities in our state, I would say ninety eight percent of them are there as foster care children, mm -hmm. um, and the over reliance of residential lies primarily with um, DHR. There are, we do have a program in our state that's called the Multiple Needs Child Committee. And it was introduced prior to the initiatives we've described, but it, it, its intent was to bring, bring together local service agencies in a county um, where uh, where there's an issue of a of a child needing more intensive community care and to prevent a residential placement. So in order for a child to qualify for this multi needs staffing, the child would need to have two service agencies that make up the committee involved in the child's life. So it would be special education and may have may receive special education services. They may receive um, Department of Mental Health Services like inpatient counseling, um, or they could be involved with the juvenile justice system and special education. And there's there's a pot of money, if you will, that each regional or local multi uh, multi needs child um, committee has to determine, OK, what services can we put into the community to support this child with the money that we have collaboratively? But there are also times when this multi needs child agency does fund for limited periods of time placement in residential facilities. And so those could be just children who were not associated with DHR, but the majority of children um, who end up there will more than likely leave residential. If they're in foster care, they'll leave residential at 18, 19. They may or may not be signed up, depending on if they have a good social worker to get adult mental health services in the community. Um, a lot of adult mental health centers in the community have been because of the Wyatt lawsuit have been dispersed so we don't have we have I think a better in some ways a better community service provision in terms of uh, institutionalization for adults because of the Wyatt lawsuit than we have for children so um you know, I, I don't know right off the bat how many kids who kind of leave DHR from a residential end up in a mental health group home or in Bryce, which is our state hospital. Um, but based on, you know, national numbers, it doesn't look good for, for chances. <clears throat> and Lena raises from Connecticut, language, neurodiversity, race, culture, and economic status is a barrier for our kids to get services. It sounds like, Andrea, from what you've said before, that some of those are definitely issues you're facing in Alabama mm -hmm. um, and getting sort of the, sort of the growth of community-based services in areas that are clearly economically 
less well off. I think it's the way you phrased it. Right. Earlier. Right. I mean, the distinction, the distinction between the type of um, local mental health service you would get in Jefferson, which is our Birmingham area, and what you would get in a poor county, um, say in Selma, Dallas, huge, huge gap for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. Have you found, I mean, you, you are a, you're a special protection and advocacy agency. Let me go there because you're located at the University of Alabama. Um, has there been much reach or discussion with the various universities in Alabama about helping to increase um, coverage in sort of their harder to serve areas? Has there been any work on that? Good question. Um, the the university the university itself, and I'll just say broadly, in, um, an ADAP, for instance, have a we have a law school at University of Alabama, and we have a children's clinic there, and it's run by my colleague um, Jenny Ryan. And what what she does is is attempt to train law students to be advocates in special education in juvenile court. And so we have a clinic where every semester law students go out and, and learn the fundamentals of special ed and juvenile court law. They get to participate in various um, cases and staff cases. And Jenny, um, because we are close in proximity and, and are sort of part of what we call that Black Belt region in Tuscaloosa, we're able to kind of build out some of the advocacy there when it comes to resources because we have this clinic and these law students. Um, we have we've had some grants in the in the past that um, we've received in order to kind of build out our, our black belt um, work. So we've had, I think in the past two, three years, we've had two different attorneys who've just been assigned to the black belt area to staff cases um, and children's cases in particular. So each um, university kind of has a, sometimes has a special interest. I know Auburn had a lot of work in um, transition age youth work, but it's always been a concern of mine that for this, for the universities that are very close to the back black belt, which both Auburn and Alabama are, you know, you, you may have some student led initiatives, but not anything, I think, in terms of long term um, build out um, in terms of service or, you know, education or funding. Okay. And a, a question that sort of came to my mind is, given that you've talked about that you guys have an over-reliance on sort of the, the state-level institutions, I'd be interested in, I mean, you've been talking about what you've been doing for the community side. For those of you that tend to send more people out of state than have to get services rather than keep them in state is sort of what have been, what have you been trying to do at your level to stop kids going out of state and create those community-based services within your state. So if you've got some ideas or thoughts on that, feel free to put that in in the chat. That would be wonderful. Um, Andrew, if you've got some thoughts on that, and Diane, if you do too, that would be great. Eric, I apologize. What was the question again? I was typing something while you were speaking. No problem. Focusing on sort of what are you, what are people doing at the state level to reduce mm. sort of the sending kids out of state and out of home, mm. and versus Andrea's problem, which is they've got too much <laughs> in state. Um, and so, what have people been trying at the state level to sort of foster those state resources for community-based services? I can I can start until um, other folks join in, but obviously folks from the network should take precedence. Um, I can share that there's kind of two different clusters, right? One is the building up of services, and there's lots to talk about there. Um, you know, the, uh, in Maine, the Department of Justice just recently um, issued findings around how they need to improve their community-based service system, and there's so there's all sorts of pieces there, like making sure that 
um, respite is available. I, I cannot really overstate the importance of respite to foster and therapeutic foster care parents and biological parents just having a break. And it's a, it's a relatively cheap and easy solution for a state to have, a, you know, respite homes and the respite homes don't burn out because the kid isn't there that long. I mean, it's sometimes you just have to kind of keep keep the situation fluid enough so that everybody gets what they need and they can continue on with their lives. Uh, one of the other key pieces is making sure that the daily rate for foster parents is enough and that foster parents get um, case management. So someone else is taking that child to the 75 appointments that they need to get to. Um, it's just, it's all, you know, there's a lot of really basic pieces that make a huge difference. Therapeutic foster care. Um, and as Andrea mentioned, having someone help train parents um, on behavior support and de-escalation, all of that really basic stuff. Most families want to keep their kids at home and they just don't know how. So putting those services in place are tremendously helpful in reducing the pressure for out-of-state placements. But then there's also, I think, <clears throat> structural issues. Like there are in many states still financial incentives so that money is going to facilities as opposed to, um, to these community-based services. So from a state policy perspective, you can start looking at those funding formulas <coughs> and adjusting them. That's one thing. So it's just harder. I mean, water runs downhill. And so for a child welfare worker, if they're sitting in their office and all they have to do is fill out a couple of forms and that child is gone, it's simpler, cheaper and easier to place a child in a residential facility than it is to do all these things like make calls and see if respite can be arranged and see if that um, the, the case manager actually showed up and all of those things. I mean, those take more work. And so you need to change the structure um, at the state level so that water is running in the correct direction. So I think those are some of the things. And then um, some states have just said we're not using these facilities anymore. They're dangerous. And those like those sort of stop um, stop work order solutions are dramatic um, and take a lot of energy. So you try to do sort of, I think, the easier things first before you get to that, because the amount of political capital it takes to get state to state government to say we're not sending kids to out-of-state facilities anymore is a lot. Um, and it takes a lot of energy on the part of advocates. Mm -hmm. Looks like other folks have some thoughts, so I'll stop talking there. Dawn agreed with you that respite is vital. Um, and I just asked if there are other states that would be interested in Andrea, if there's something that's been going on in Alabama on this, is, is has there been work to sort of increase the amount of respite um, that you've either been doing through your work or other people in other states and what they've been thinking about in terms of respite and getting more, more funding and more ability to, to take advantage of it. And then Elizabeth wrote, Elizabeth Booth wrote, we respite the issue we see in Delaware is that although funding for respite has become more widely available for kids on Medicaid, it's very difficult to find providers willing to work with kids with challenging behaviors. Mm -hmm. So families are having difficulty actually using the funds. Mm -hmm. And then she asked a question and feel free to answer in the chat. Has any other state identified a solution to this problem? I know one of the possible solutions is, of course, increasing the rate of pay. Um, it needs to be financially worthwhile and possible. I mean, to be fair, sometimes, you know, the house may, you know, things may get broken. Um, it, it can be expensive. There can be a lot of travel costs. It's not, this is a family that's taking in a child who is um, going through a transition, and they're often kids that don't transition terribly well so the risk the respite receiving respite household may have even more challenges um, than the right you know the foster care home had so there's a lot of pieces and that's again where like more supports um make it possible it's the same thing with any other respite not just respite for kids with sed But if anyone's yeah. got some thoughts on other solutions mm -hmm. to solving that problem, that would be great. Yeah. Or ways that they've been able to, well, in addition to solving 
Elizabeth's issue, has there been ways that they've been able to get more funding? Um, I'd be interested in Elizabeth and what kind of arguments you made to get that sort of attention and that kind of support in Delaware for respite funding. Because um, I think that's not the case in all states. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a good level of support at the national level, but I think it there are times where states have a harder time finding the additional funding for that and making the case that this is an important thing to do. Andrea, is there a time frame on your settlement on when this should all be implemented or? is on the EPS. mental health on the EPSDT yeah. settlement um the memorandum of understanding was was supposed to be operating through October of last year so I'm going to check actually with Nancy who mainly and Nancy Anderson our office who spearheaded most of the EPSDT work um, to see what what's up next for that, um, because given the numbers I kind of just described, I think we're kind of at a crossroads about, you know, what are we going to do now? <laughs> you know, with with um, there's always the option to to take legal action, I think. But is is this the time now and what what will need to go into that conversation? And who have you been, who have you found to be good partners to help you moving this all forward in terms of creating more community based systems? Partners in the state? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's good. It's, it's pretty much a, in Alabama, you, there's not too many people that kind of are raising their hands to be partners, particularly. It's more of, you know, you know somebody who's known somebody who's been fighting this fight kind of for years, um, and maybe they were a retired community mental health specialist, or maybe they've had expert work in a particular area of mental health. Um, I think the autism community in general and those people who, those autism societies in the state are good partners. Uh, they clearly see the need for, for this type of, of um, service for, for Medicaid eligible children with autism. The, the collaborations with um, children with mental health needs are not as um, concrete. So we kind of looked to, to people who've kind of been in the trenches for many years um, who would support us. Okay. Um, Diane put in the chat, the Families First Act may be a resource in states as well, and then a link to the, to some material on the Family First. Yeah, that, that is, at the federal government level, that's something that they've been very strong about supporting is the Family First programs, um, and trying to, you know, it's, it's one of the Fed's attempts to sort of rebalance in some respects and try to make sure that we're putting resources more into receiving services and having the kids stay at home um, and getting those services rather than being either shipped out of state or shipped to um, foster homes uh, where the services may not be as robust or as strong. So that is definitely uh, something that's been, that's still been being worked on over time. Um, I think just generally speaking, Eric, I think funding for these services is important, but I think funding by itself isn't enough. It has to be funding with support. So getting increasing the daily rate that a therapeutic foster care provider receives is important, but it's also important that there be somebody there to help the parent um, do what needs to be done and provide that support. And there needs to be a therapy provider in the community, not just one that is can be paid, but one that is trained and is willing to serve these kids and has openings after school.
school. I mean, there's all sorts of practical pieces to it. And I think sometimes we talk about the money and the money is really important, but you, the money by itself isn't enough. You have to solve the practical everyday problems that come with raising kids that have high needs. Well, and I think, I definitely think in this situation, you know, for those that are part of the PNAs, think about um, reaching out and creating those kind of collaborations to help move these kinds of things forward. For those that are not part of the protection and advocacy system, you know, feel free to collaborate with your PNAs to try to help address this. Because I think, I think we've really, I think the message is getting out there about the importance of home and community over institutions, but there's still roadblocks and an old school thinking, I'll go that route, um, that can be a, a, a very large barrier to solving these problems. And I think really, and I, and I think at times that runs in, you run into a lot more of the stigma issues on the mental health side. Um, than you do in maybe potentially the development of disabilities or intellectual disability side. Mm -hmm. So the more you can think broadly about your collaborations and, and be sort of proactive on those, you, you can create a good coalition to really work on these topics and, and really get people to think about it and, and focus on it. And so, you know, I think, Alabama has been very proactive and very um, forward thinking about how to try to address some of these situations. And we just need to, at times it'd be great if we could solve it all at the national level, but I think at times it's more of a just, you sort of have to slog the state by state to address these things as it goes along. Um, so you just gotta keep, keep moving forward on some of these things and it's, as Andrea has shown, not always a quick, a quick solution. <laughs> and you, you need to like think about as many different area areas of advocacy and as many different, you know, uh, DM the DMH advocacy worked the, and without litigation to some respects. I mean, it got some things done. The DHR, not so much. That's not gonna work. Sometimes the media pressure works, certain agencies, sometimes it doesn't, you know, you just keep your eye on the prize, so to speak, and then think about your strategies as they go. Mm -hmm. Has it cost you, Andrea, at times issues when, well, not that there's probably been huge changes in your administrations, but <laughs> uh, knowing what I know about Alabama, but has has that caused you delays and problems when a new governor and a new leadership comes in? Well, we've had um, not so much in that there, um, there hasn't been too much of a distinction between the, the policy. Now, now our current governor, I think, has has made some 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 effort. Um, I think it, it's interesting that even at the governor's level, you may get more openness in a particular population on a particular issue than you would at the commissioner level. And so if you have sort of a hands-off uh, governor on certain certain departments, then you may just, you know, you may just have to go to litigation at that point. So it's it's all very highly political, of course, and our state is not always singing the same tune um, for each individual kind of population. And the foster can, to my, to my huge disappointment, the the foster care kids seem to be getting the, really the short end. So that's why I keep. Mm -hmm. Do you have a speculation on um, why the foster kids? Well, um, there are just a number of things. I think um, you know we filed class action lawsuit many years ago, the RC consent decree that. Um, help to get the get the services individualized, but that did not end well. And the administration in place in with DHR has just been a very each commissioner 
since the end of RC has just been very, very challenging to work with. And if you have a governor who's just kind of lets, allows DHR to kind of drive, drive it, then, you know, it's, it's very hard to get past that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's kind of anecdotal, but with DMH, we were able to settle the Wyatt lawsuit, which was our adult institutionalization case many years ago with DMH. And since then, the, the legacy of working with DMH, it largely has been a lot more productive. So that as far as the politics, that, that's kind of how that, that plays out. And I would even, well, I could go on, but I would even say the Department of Youth Services, we've had a better, so better working relationship. <laughs> so that's the way it is. I don't think you're probably the only state that has yeah. this, this issue where someone might be better than somebody else yeah. on these topics. Um, have you at times found the that you've made better progress on the youth side than the adult side or the adult side versus the youth side? Well, for the purposes, I think, of of making system change in both child welfare and mental health. Um, I think our, our culture in the state plays a great deal of play into how do you address system change for children. Um, I think that the philosophy here and the, the politics here are definitely more conservative. So you will have more of a of a sense of that something the government should not be involved in and how I raise my children and what I do. And if it's a kid, then they probably did something they shouldn't have done. And it's the parents issue. Whereas with the adult system, I think oddly enough, I think there's been more of an appreciation of, of understanding some of the, um, of the cost saving measures, maybe we shall say, of, of serving adults in the community and um, some of the legacy of Bryce, I think we've done a great job with. Um, so it's, it, it's better. It's definitely better um, for the, for the kids, but you're just kind of uh, facing now, I think more right now, I think you're facing more of a political uh personality type issue in state government more than even so the philosophy. I think even that's kind of um, mellowed out a little bit in the state. I think now more of the issue now is with the, with the politics of who you're dealing with and the commissioner who's of course appointed and has been there past, past administration. So she's not going very far right now, <laughs> going anywhere right now. Okay, well, let me say thank you to Diane and Andrea for leading the discussions today and for everyone's questions. And as Kelly said in the chat, please register for the part two of this presentation, which is going to be this Friday from Bazelon, Advancing an Alternative Peer-Led Community-Based Services that Promote Equity and Safety for All. Uh, this is going to be presented by Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, and it will take place this Friday from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. So please click that link and register for that. And you can continue the discussion on ways to sort of enhance the community. And again, thank you, Diane, and thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Kelly and Nashbed and SAMHSA for their support for this webinar. And I will now turn it over to Kelly. Thank you, Eric. Um, I would just like to Piggyback on what Eric said, thank you so much, Andrea and Diane, for your presentation today. And I would like to give SAMHSA a special thank you for allowing us to share this information with you. When you log out of this, um, out of this screen, you will see a survey in your browser. Please take a few moments to fill that out for us and provide your feedback. Thank you again for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care. Thank you.